In one of the previous videos, I said that it takes a few minutes to learn BAM, and when I rewatched that video, my immediate thoughts were, dude, if you're so smart, why don't you explain BAM in a few minutes? So that's what we're doing today. Let's address the elephant in the room. CSS is hard. You need to know a lot of things to write good styles. You need to know different types of selectors, box model, formatting context, flex box, grid, and just diving into styles and starting to write what comes to mind first quickly lead to spaghetti code that is not systematic, that's hard to maintain. So that's why engineers came up with CSS methodologies. CSS methodology is basically just a fancy way of saying a set of rules that you follow when you write styles. And BAM is just one of them. BAM seems a little annoying at the beginning because it has this weird syntax with double underscore, double dash. But once it clicks, you realize that maintaining projects written in BAM is so easy. You don't have this butterfly effect when you change one thing on one side of the project and something else like completely unrelated breaks. So BAM stands for block element modifier. And let's focus on blocks for now. A block is a single, potentially reusable part of the layout. And let's go through an exercise of identifying blocks in this layout. So the most obvious are button, card, and grid. So why are these considered blocks? Because you can take them and use them in different layouts and contexts. Even here, you can see the button is used inside cards and as a CTA at the bottom of the page. And all of these blocks, uh, except for the grid, which is a special case, which we'll cover shortly, can function on their own, meaning that semantically they could work as a, as a single unit. Okay, so once we've identified which parts of the layout will convert into blocks, we need to give them names. And one tip I can give you for naming uh, entities in BAM is to describe the layout instead of content. Here's what I mean. So we have this page about parks in Ontario. One thing we could do is name the card a park card. That would work for this page because it's only about parks. But imagine if you want to reuse this card component on a different page that's about lakes in Ontario. That would not work semantically because park and lake is not the same thing. So always try to describe the layout in the name of the block instead of describing content. Now, let's briefly pause on why grid is a special case. The reason for that is that it cannot stand on its own semantically. Its value is purely functional. It works as a container for holding other blocks. But because it's such a common pattern, it makes perfect sense to abstract it as a single block. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Blocks, reusable parts of the layout, either semantic or functional like a grid. Now let's move on to elements. So an element is something that exists only within the context of a block and doesn't work on its own. When I say doesn't work on its own, I mainly mean three things. It doesn't have a semantic meaning on its own, it doesn't have a function on its own, and it has styles that only make sense inside the context of a block. So let's consider this button, for example. It has a label and an icon, so why doesn't this icon make sense outside the button? Essentially, like, what function would it serve? It doesn't carry semantic meaning, right? It's just an arrow, like, it could point at something, but I guess, like, if there's no something, like, what's the meaning of it? If it did have a meaning, its margin would mess up reusability, and we'll cover that a little later. So in BEM terminology, the label and the icon are the elements of the button, and we identify them with the double underscore notation. So again, to summarize, block, reusable part of the layout, works on its own, uh, either semantic or functional meaning, element, part of the block that doesn't work on its own. So I hope that's clear. So before we jump into modifiers, let's uh, cover the CSS implementation. One of the core principles of BEM is to keep specificity very low. Therefore, in CSS, we avoid nesting, and there are some exceptions, but uh, in general, we avoid nesting, and instead we use just a single class selector for both the block and the element, and we put them at the top level of the style sheet. And that's why it's called flat. We keep it at the at the same level. There's no nesting, there's no concatenated selectors, nothing. Okay, so a modifier is another BAM entity. It represents a change of a state or 
a slight visual modification of either a block or an element. So let's say we want to have a different style for a button here that isn't orange, but green. In then we would create another class for this. It could look something like this, button double dash green. And double dash is a standard notation for modifiers. In HTML, we would put that on the same node as the button. And same low specificity approach applies in CSS. We would put modifiers on the same level as the block and an element. And the override will still work here because button green is declared after the button. So styles inside button green will trump styles in button. And if you want to avoid overriding uh, styles altogether, you can introduce a default modifier, which will contain only the declarations that you later change with other modifiers. Now that we've covered the basics, I want to answer a few common questions that come up when you first start using them. The first one is, can I use the modifier with an element? Yes, I have already covered that, but let's dive a little deeper here. So we have this page with all the parks and let's say we want to highlight Algonquin and make the car stretch for two columns. So you create a modifier that looks something like this. And now we can take this class and apply it to a corresponding element in the HTML. And it will make sure that the cell is stretched. And another tip while we're here, notice how the cart handles different widths easily. We should always strive to create blocks in isolation with an idea that we don't know the context where they will be used. Like here, for example, it could be a narrow column, it could be a white column, and it still works. How do I decide whether to use a modifier or create a new block? No hard rule here, but my rule of thumb is that modifiers should be used for changing just one property or like two at max, like it could be color or size or back. And let me give you an example. See how the card looks bigger, but the entire layout looks a little bit off. We have this uh, card on the right that's super tall and we should probably change the main card that we want to highlight to something that looks more like this. And you might be thinking, okay, so like we have the card block, right? Like this looks very similar because it has the same elements. So we would create a modifier that says card overlay and we would nest each element of the original card block inside and provide new styles for it. This code stinks though, because not only we create a lot of overwrites, we are raking up specificity and the more nesting we start adding to this uh, block, the harder it is to read. And imagine it's just one modifier now, but what if we add another variation to the card? Like it's going to be two, three or four. And also imagine if you need to update the default card styles. Let's say uh, you want to add padding to an image. Now you do that and this update will propagate automatically to all of the variations that you've created. In our case, it's one, but it could be more. So usually when I find myself creating a lot of overwrites, I create a new block instead of a modifier. So in this case, I would create a new block that would be called overlay card and we would nicely keep them separate. In case I want to update the original card, I update it overlay card stays intact and same goes for overlay card. Another question, can block be an element at the same time? The answer is yes. To illustrate this, let's go back to our grid. Basically each grid item can also be a card. Now, should you combine a block and an element on the same node? I don't do this very often because we are rarely writing plain HTML. Usually we're working in the context of some kind of content management system or React framework and card usually would be its own component. If you are a front-ender and you're writing this code in plain HTML first and handing it to a backender or someone who will be implementing it, they might take grid item and card and put inside a component. And that would create a lot of frustration because styles from grid item will bleed into a component. Usually I separate those two and make sure that the card sits on its own node. So logical next question, can block be another block at the same time? And the answer is also yes. And I have this code to illustrate this. In this same example, you'll see that we have container block 
and content flow block. One is basically defining the width of the content inside and side gutters, and content flow dis defines the um, vertical rhythm. So they both do different things. They they're not conflicting. So they could technically leave on the same node. Can them be used with uh, utility classes? I don't see why not, even though it sort of goes against the BAM philosophy. I do it all the time because utility classes could be extremely helpful when used in moderation. For example, in our project, I have a utility class called Visually Hidden, a common method for hiding an element visually but keeping it accessible for screen readers. I want the call to action to say, learn more about Algonquin Park, but I don't want the links to say that entire phrase. So I hide about Algonquin Park in this utility class. I could have made this another element inside the button, but since this is such a common pattern, it makes perfect sense to abstract it into utility class. The main point with utility classes is staying consistent. So if you start using this visually hidden class, make sure that you use this instead of elements or modifiers. Okay, so these are common questions that I could think of on my own. If you have more questions about BAM, don't hesitate to ask in the comments. I'll respond every single one of them. Now, bear with me, we have one more section about common mistakes, and this is very important. So the first one is using margins on blocks. And let me explain why this is such a big deal. Consider this example. Let's put a form at the bottom of our page. It looks okay, right? But the space between the button and the form is uh, like sort of tiny. So we might think, let's just add some space above by adding margin block start to newsletter form block. And it looks perfectly fine. Now there's more space and you might not even face any issues if you don't reuse the newsletter form anywhere else. Problems begin when you actually start reusing the form. So see, we have this empty space in the grid after we change the Algonquin Park to this overlay card. You get a message from your designer or your PM or your client and they say, why don't we put our form in there? And you take the form, you put it in, and you see that now we have this space at the top that comes from the block itself. And this can cause big headaches in real projects because this form could be used on hundreds or thousands of pages. And simply removing the margin will introduce a lot of regressions. And unless you have a very robust testing system in place, it can be very scary to change stuff like that. So what we usually do in these cases, we create a patch, right? Great item, newsletter form, and we reset the margin. And then we add another patch for another block and another one and another one and another one. You see how quickly it turns into a spaghetti mess of styles. Never use margins on blocks that messes up reusability big time. Okay, so next mistake I see people make with BAM is nesting classes in CSS. And it looks something like this. This defeats the purpose of BAM because the whole point of this underscore and double dash notation is to keep styles flat and specificity low. So if we do this, we basically increase specificity of elements for no particular reason. You should always strive for low specificity and flat styles and avoid nesting like this. Concatenating selectors can also go into this bucket. It's a terrible pattern because you make elements unsearchable and I made the entire video why it's... Okay, so next mistake, I want to cover is using BAM entities like utility classes. So here's a quick example. We have overlay card CTA element that looks something like this, and it has only one uh, declaration, margin block start auto. Just because it has only one declaration doesn't mean that we should copy this class and use it on any HTML element that needs this style. This goes against BAM principles because it prioritizes styles over semantics and that's not how how BAM works okay next mistake and i've seen this a lot creating elements of elements you look at the markup of the card and you think that okay so since image is inside media we'll just keep doing the same pattern with double underscore that might be some kind of css methodology but that's not them instead of this we should just keep one level of elements regardless of how deeply they nested okay and the last mistake i want to cover today is creating blocks that have too many or too few elements remember how in our project we have a grid block 
and a card block. And card block does its own thing. Grid block does its own thing. What we could have done instead is create a single block that does both. If we did that, we would end up with a block that has nine elements. Not only this could be hard to scan because the CSS file would become too big, we're also missing out on creating a system by abstracting two blocks that do uh, different things. Similar concept applies to creating blocks that are not reused at all. So for example, we could have abstracted card content into a single block, but if we're not reusing it anywhere, what's the point? So this was BEM in a nutshell. If you have any other questions about it, feel free to ask in the comments. And thank you everyone who subscribed to my channel. We just crossed 800 subscribers. Doesn't seem like a lot in YouTube universe, but for me, this is a big deal. It just makes me want to continue making these videos as helpful as I can. And again, thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.